Today, you run from me because I am strong. I am courageous. I am an overcomer. Well, amen, and uh, hello again. Welcome to New Life Church. You're catching us today in part two of a five-week series called Overcomer. And we're really talking into how to overcome some very practical things in our life, because as many of you know, God hasn't just called us conquerors, but He's actually called us more than conquerors, which means there are some things, some everyday practical things in our Christian walk with God we're going to have to overcome in order to be more than conquerors. In fact, look at someone and say, you're an overcomer. You are an overcomer. So as we head into today, I wonder if you can remember or imagine or take yourself back to the most comfortable place you've ever been in. Uh, I don't know if it was maybe a very comfortable couch you sat in, or a hammock that you slept in, or a bed that you lay in that just felt like a warm hug. Or what's the most comfortable thing you've ever been in? Can you think about that for a moment? And if you have something to share, will you tell the person next to you what it is? What's the most comfortable thing you've ever slept in? Go, go for it. Well, I don't know how many of you have had those mornings where you wake up and your bed just feels extra cozy. Maybe that happened to some of you. That's why you're at the 1115 service today. <laughs> but uh, yesterday, I just happened to have one of those days. It was a bit cold. Do you remember yesterday was a bit cold? It was a bit chilly in the morning. And uh, my wife graciously let me sleep until like 8, which is a miracle in our house. And I, I, was laying, I woke up at about 8, and I was lying there, and suddenly my bed just felt oh, extra cozy, and I was just oh, getting wrapped up. I was so lazy, in fact, that I WhatsApped my teenage daughter to bring me some coffee, um, and she wasn't answering the WhatsApp, so I eventually just phoned her, and I was like, please make Dad some coffee. She was not impressed with that request. Uh, but she bought me some coffee, and so I was lying in bed, and I just felt so comfortable. In fact, I felt so comfortable, I just thought... God, man, it would be great if I just never had to leave. Hey, have you ever been so comfortable that you just thought, oh, I could live here. I could just press pause on my life and just live here forever. But the reality is we've probably had that experience, and it reminds us of something quite important, the fact that comfort actually paralyzes us. The, the more comfortable we are, the more paralyzed we are by this feeling of comfort, because this is what comfort does. Comfort makes you not want to leave. Comfort makes you want to live in that place, in that space forever. And the problem, however, becomes that most of us are chasing comfort. If we had to be really honest, you're living and working and earning so that you can become more comfortable. This is what we do as human beings. We, we strive in our lives for comfort. And this becomes a problem because the more comfortable we become, the more paralyzed we become. And what do we become paralyzed to? Well, we start becoming paralyzed to the world and the needs of the world and the needs of the, uh, our cities and the needs of our communities and we get so comfortable that eventually we don't care so much about what's happening around us. All we care about is how to get more comfortable. And I want to remind you today, church, that God cares. God cares. There are things in our city, things in our community, things in our world that break the heart of God. And we know God cares so much about the orphans, and He cares about the widows. He cares about those suffering, those facing injustice. God cares about those who are hurting. He cares about the naked. He cares about the hungry and the prisoners. God cares. He aligns Himself with these people. He says, what you do to these people, you do to me. God cares. In fact, Jesus taught almost more on this topic than any other topic 
And I don't know about you, but the reality is we are exposed to lots of needs, especially living here in South Africa. I mean, come on. We see the needs all around us all the time. You can be driving to work, and you, you'll drive past some informal sediments, and you'll drive past some homeless people struggling at the corners of the robots or outside the garage waiting for food. You might sit down and you open Facebook, and suddenly there's a lot of bad news. And you're seeing kids in our local community that have been kidnapped and killed, people saying goodbye to those that they've lost through disease or accidents. You're going to see farm murders and violence in our neighborhoods and, and families killing families. And there's so much bad news that we're exposed to again and again. Then you switch on TV and you see families literally starving in Syria and children drowning in the sea trying to escape war and the immigrant crisis. And there's terrorism and school shootings and famine and war and tragedy and death and murder and poverty. And it just goes on and on. And I don't know about you, but it just seems like it's getting worse. And then there's still natural disasters and, and landslides and flooding and drought and fires. And, and there just seems to be so much bad news to go around. So much bad news. And what do we do in response to this? Well, a lot of us, we might see this, and we might even be moved by it in a moment. We, we might even switch off Facebook or put off the TV and put the screens down, and we might even feel like some kind of sadness or despair or anger or frustration about the situations. We might even say, pray to God, like, God, just please step in, please help, please bring rain. Please make a way. But then what happens, church? Five minutes later, we're back to life. Five minutes later, we've dried our tears. We're back to taking selfies and making supper and getting our two-year-olds potty trained. And life has a way of sucking us back in to where even though our hearts were stirred just a moment ago, right now we're just back into the rut of life, chasing comfort and convenience, trying to make it by. And this should worry us. It should worry us as a church because the commission to make a difference, the, the, the commission to work on behalf of God, the, the commission to act on behalf of God, to fix the problems in the world, it's given to you. It's given to me. It's given to the children of God to solve. We are the ambassadors of the kingdom of God on this earth. It is up to us to bring God's kingdom, his heavenly kingdom, here to earth. It's on us. It's, it's not up to a government. It's not up to any government of the world. It's not up to the United Nations. It's not up to our municipalities. It's, it's up to us, the children of God. You, me, the Christians. We have been given this mandate to fix the world's problems. God's delivery system for hope is you and me. God's delivery system for, for life is you and me. God's delivery system for the light to penetrate the darkness is you and me. It's not going to be done by the angels. And God himself is not going to step down into earth and do this because he sent you and me to do this. And yet, we're stuck in our comfort and our convenience, and we're paralyzed by this stuff. We're so paralyzed that there's almost like a spirit of apathy in the world today. You know what apathy is? Ap apathy is a desire to do nothing. <laughs> the lack of concern, a lack of interest. There is an apathy epidemic in our society and in the church today. An indifference to the world's problems. We see a problem, someone else can solve it. Someone else can do that. <laughs> someone else can meet that need. If we are going to live 
Like children of God, if we're going to be the hands and feet of Jesus, that speaks of action. We're going to live like Jesus lived. It means that as a church, we have to overcome the spirit of apathy. We have to overcome the spirit of indifference and the lack of concern. We have to overcome this as a church. If we're going to live as more than conquerors and make a difference in this world for Jesus Christ, it cannot be anyone else's problem anymore. It's got to become ours. You know, there's people that say that our generation in our society, we've become known as a meh generation. You know why? Because you'll say to people, what cause is burning on your heart? Meh. Well, what, what do you feel passionate about? Meh. Well, what do you want to change in the city? Meh. What is God calling you to do? Come on, you are the hands and the feet of, the, uh, of Jesus Christ. You have a calling, you have a purpose. What is your purpose? <laughs> and in some way, we've become this apathetic generation of Christians. And we look at the problems in this world and we're like, Meh. And yet when I look at Scripture, I see that that is not the kind of church we're called to be. Not by a long shot. When I look at what Jesus modeled for us, that is not what he modeled for us. That is not what he taught. When I look at Scripture, I see that faith is not about belief. Faith is also about action. Genuine faith, true faith is about action. It's not just about head knowledge and theology. You know, the book of James is great at reminding us about this. He does it in several places. In the one place is James 2 verse 8. Verse 18, he says, Now some may argue that some people have faith and others have good deeds. And listen, as as a church kid my whole life, I have heard this argument to death. And people really say, oh, I'm not called to that kind of stuff. No, 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 I'm called to work on my relationship with God and and invest in me. And and, and, those people, they can deal with the human trafficking. Those people can help the orphans. Those people can serve the poor. Those people can, can, can visit the prisoners. I'm not called. That's not my personality. And James would say, some people argue this. Some people argue that some have faith and others have good deeds. But then James says, how can you show me your faith if you don't have good deeds? He's saying real faith doesn't stop in the head, it moves to the heart, then it moves to the hands, and it moves to the feet, and it equals action. He says, I will show you my faith by my good deeds. That's what real faith looks like. Real faith is not apathy. It's not indifference. It's not a lack of concern. Real faith, genuine, God-honoring faith equals action. Every single time. And if we are going to live as overcomers, we have got to overcome the spirit of apathy in the church. There's actually a parable that Jesus tells that speaks into this. There's this very religious man that goes up to Jesus. And uh, this religious man says, Jesus, what do I need to do to get by? Like, what do I need to do to get in to make sure my eternity is secure? What do I need to do? And, And Jesus says, well, what's the law say to you? So the guy says, well, the law says I have to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and mind, and I have to love my neighbor as myself. So Jesus says, well, go and do that. And then the guy's like, whoa, 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 that word neighbor is a little bit unclear. What do you really mean by neighbor? In other words, he's asking what a lot of us ask when we have to write a test is, what's a minimum requirement here? Like, what's the least I have to do to qualify? Uh, what's the most, or how can I stay as comfortable as I can stay? What's the, what's the least I have to do in order to get in to this thing? And so Jesus tells this parable that has easily become one of the most famous parables in all of Scripture. He tells of a man that was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, and on his way, he must have gone via South Africa because he got mugged. <laughs> and Scripture says he, he got beaten up, and then he was left in a ditch for dead, bleeding, they're dying. And so we pick up the story in the book of Luke chapter 10, and we're going to pick it up from verse 31. It says, by chance, a priest came along. Oh, thank goodness. A priest is here. I mean, what did the word priest tell us? 
It tells us that this is a man devoted to God. So devoted, he gave his life to God. This is a man knowledgeable about Scripture. This is a man who gets the heart of God, who understands the character of God. He doesn't only understand the character of God, he teaches it. This is great news. There's a priest coming to help this man. What happens? But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road, and he passed him by. Verse 32, a temple assistant walked over. (laughs) Okay, good news. Obviously, the priest was busy, had some counseling to do. He has a temple assistant. This, This is someone who works within the temple of God. This is a worker for God, a temple builder. Yeah, this is great news. A temple assistant walked over. He looked at him lying there, but he also passed by on the other side. I don't know if there's a greater picture of apathy in all of Scripture than this. And I don't know if there's a clearer mirror for us of what we're doing as a church over and over again as children of God in an apathetic generation where we see the need, we know God, and we do nothing. And so we see this temple messenger, a guy who builds God's kingdom, saying, I'm too busy for that. I've got to go do some of God's work. I can't do this. Man, I, that's too risky. I might get hurt. This might be a trap. So he does nothing. But then a despised Samaritan came along. Despised Samaritan. You can imagine the audience thinking, what's going to happen now? Is he going to just finish a job? Take whatever's left of the man and finish him off? But when he saw the man... He felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn where he took care of him. It's interesting that the first person to see this dying man the way God saw him was not a priest, was not a temple messenger, but a despised Samaritan ended up being the one who worked on behalf of God. And God honored that action more than he honored the belief of the priest or the service of the temple messenger. God honored the despised Samaritan who actually put some feet to his faith, some action to his belief, and acted out in compassion the way God acted in compassion when he looked at you and me who were far from him. Faith always equals action, true faith. The problem is many of us are waiting to feel compassion. But we need to move out of obedience. And where we're in the vicinity of the need, compassion can come, but we're not even putting ourselves in places where we can see the need. And so we have a generation... It's apathetic, not acting out the values of Christ. So why do you think it is, church? Why is it that you and I can identify so well with the first two characters in that story? Why is it that we don't care like Jesus cared? That we don't have compassion like God has compassion? Why is that? I think one of the reasons is If we had to be honest, we're exposed in the 21st century to way too much information. We know in real time what's happening right around the world. Updates and live feeds and our apps uh, push notifications and there's breaking news 24 hours a day. And and, and maybe we're overexposed to the needs of the world. And we find that when there's so much to care about, I end up caring about nothing. When, When there's too much to care about, and I realize I can't care about anything, then I start to care about nothing. Maybe we're feeling overexposed. Maybe we're also not just having too much information thrown at us, but possibly you don't really believe you can make a difference. We don't really believe we can do anything. And, and I hear this in conversations with people. They say, I'm one person. What can I do? Uh, I'm not over there. And I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that kind of resource. And 
Most people say to me, hey, I need help. Well, I'm not worried about them. I need help. I don't feel like I have enough comfort and convenience in my life. I'm struggling to pay the bills. I'm struggling to like my boss. I'm struggling to keep my job. I'm struggling to pay my, my kids. And make sure they're well fed and clothed. I'm struggling. So what difference can I make to someone else when I feel like I'm barely getting by? Not only that, not only is the volume of information so much, not, not only do we feel like we can't really do much, but we had to be honest, comfort really has become our goal. Comfort's become the goal of our life. We're more worried about how we can live easier and live more convenient. And so we don't want to get involved in all that stuff. It just looks too messy and complicated. But I want to remind you, church, comfort's like a drug. The more you have of it, the more you're going to want it and want it and desire it and work for it. And eventually, your comfort's even going to fill into your faith to where even your version of Christianity is a consumer-based version where you're happy as long as you're getting what you want and it doesn't make you too uncomfortable. Even your relationship with God becomes comfort-driven, where you truly believe in your heart at some level that God actually exists to serve you. And He exists to make you happy and serve your needs. And, and, and you love God as long as He takes away every headache and makes your bank account get bigger. But you don't fully believe that you exist to serve Him. And you've forgotten that in order to follow Jesus, you had to lay down your life. Pick up your cross, and you've, you've got to follow him where he leads you. Many people truly believe that God would never expose them to heartache and heartbreak and suffering and persecution. And so comfort has become our goal, and, and there's so much information to go around, and we don't feel like we can make a difference, and so we do nothing. We become apathetic. So how do we change this? How do we overcome this? If we're going to live as more than conquerors, if we realize that we cannot be the effective bride of Christ on earth, living apathetically, how do we overcome this? Well, one of the things we're going to have to start doing is we're going to have to consistently expose ourselves to things that create a righteous discomfort. Can you say consistently? We're going to have to consistently expose ourselves to things that create a righteous discomfort. Can you say righteous discomfort? We're going to have to consistently, constantly, again and again and again, put ourselves in places where we can see what God's heart breaks for. Consistently. You know, I have a personal life rule is that I, will, I have made a commitment to myself that I will go on a mission trip at least once a year. And you know what I call that annual mission trip? My friends and family and staff know it well. As my annual slap in the face. Because that's what it feels like to me. When I'm on missions and I go and serve some of the poorest of the poor and sit with them and hear their stories and see how much joy some of them have, it's in these moments where I just get so much perspective of my life and I have so much gratitude for what God has blessed me with and He stirs up in me and speaks to me in ways that I can't hear when I'm in the busyness of life and so I consistently expose myself to things that create a righteous discomfort inside of me. And when I'm on missions, I often feel like I will never lose this feeling. I will never lose this perspective. But then I come back to South Africa, and I come back to work and managing staff and having a wife and being a father to kids and paying my tax and taking kids to school and taking the cat to the vet and make, helping make supper. And it, You just get sucked back into life, and you lose that perspective. The only way to create a righteous discontent in your life it's to expose yourself to it consistently because this stuff leaks. And so I've made a personal commitment that I will do several local outreaches every single year. Several. I, I want to be exposed to things in my city that are outside of my bubble of where I work and where I live. Because there are needs in the city that I will never see unless I go there intentionally. 
And so I expose myself to these things consistently. And the reason you have to expose yourself is because it is so easy to show some kind of concern behind a screen, reading things on News 24, reading things on Facebook, watching things on TV. As long as you're behind a screen, can I just say, you stay anonymous and unaccountable. And you're never going to be moved past your apathy because you're comfortable. But something happens when you're sitting across from a prisoner, face to face, flesh to flesh, looking in their eyes, hearing their story of what life has done to them. Something happens when you are playing soccer on a field full of orphans, hearing about their struggles and needs. There's something that happens in your heart when you are able to sit in a shack of someone who was born into poverty and can't imagine a way out. Suddenly, you're not anonymous anymore. Suddenly, you're not unaccountable. Now, you are moved by compassion. You went on obedience, exposed yourself consistently, and now the compassion comes, but the compassion doesn't come unless you go. The compassion doesn't come unless you expose yourself. You've got to be in these places of need. And then this righteous discontent starts to well up inside of you. You know what a righteous discontent means? It, it means that you are starting to want to move on behalf of God on earth. That your heartbeat starts to beat for the same thing that, that God's heart beats for. That your heart starts to break for the very same things that God's heart breaks for. Your heart aligns with his, and you start to see people the way he sees them. You start to love them the way he loves them, and now there is no room for apathy in your heart, and your apathy turns into passion. And that passion is going to cause you to action. But unless we consistently expose ourselves to things that cause a righteous discomfort, we will never move beyond our apathy. We actually see Paul doing this very thing. Paul, man, he wasn't always Paul. Before he became Paul, he was a guy called Saul. And Saul hated Christians. Some of you, you might not like Christians very much. Paul would give you a run for your money. He hated them so much that he would hunt them down and kill them. He was a Christian terrorist. He would go from village to village looking for Christian families to murder. But then Jesus got a hold of Paul. Man, and now he is transformed, and that passion that was against God is now turned into a passion for God, and he's one of the boldest Jesus-sharing people in all of Scripture. And Paul writes these words in Romans 9. He says, With Christ as my witness, I speak with utter truthfulness. My conscience and the Holy Spirit confirm it. He's saying three times, I mean this, I mean this, this is the truth. I mean this, I mean this, this is the truth. He says, My heart is filled. With bitter sorrow and unending grief for my people, my Jewish brothers and sisters, I would be willing to be forever cursed, cut off from Christ, if that would save them. Can you hear his heart, his, his anguish? He's carrying their burdens. His heart is breaking for the very same things that God's heart breaks for. He says, my, my heart is filled with anguish. I have this righteous discomfort, this righteous discontent for the state of things as they are. And I would even be willing to give up my eternity if that would save them. I would even be willing to go to hell. I'd be willing to be cut off from God forever if that would just save them. And now his heart breaks for the same things that God's heart breaks for. And why does Paul feel this? Because he read about the Jews in the Sunday times? No. He was among them. He lived among them, ministered to them, and fellowship with them. And, and he was consistently exposed to them again and again and again and again. And God began to develop this righteous discomfort inside of him. Where now, he is as passionate about reaching them as God is. If we're going to overcome apathy, we're going to consistently need to expose ourselves to things that cause a righteous discomfort inside of us. So what do we need to start to do? 
if you're going to be serious about this, if, if you're going to move past the meh generation and move, move into action where your faith becomes real and true, what do we need to start to do? Well, for us to overcome apathy, we're going to have to just focus on something. And I want to encourage you to focus on something. Pick a cause. Focus on something. You know, the reality is we are overexposed. There are so many needs that we are exposed to. And we can maybe do a little bit of a difference in a lot of places. Or we can make, through, through the guidance of the Holy Spirit, He can focus our lives to make a big change in one or two places. So I want to ask you, what does your heart naturally break for? What naturally stirs you up? What naturally makes you angry about the world or frustrated or heartbroken or sad or in anguish? What does your heart already naturally break for? Pay attention to those things because there's a reason your heart is caught up by those issues and causes. There are many things in life that will catch your attention, but there's only a few things that will catch your heart. So what catches your heart? What catches your heart? For some of you, it's the plot of the unborn and protecting them. For some of you, it's racial injustice or feeding the hungry or human trafficking, housing orphans, cancer research, mental illness, saving the unsaved, helping people find freedom from addiction or alcoholism or meth. There's so many different things we can be passionate about, but there's only one or two things that's going to catch your heart, that's going to stir you up. Pay attention to that, but there's a reason those things break your heart. There's a reason those issues are close to you. So focus on something. What is it God wants you to focus on? What, what issue does He want you to get behind? And maybe you don't have to start something. Maybe you can join an organization or a group of people that have already started something, but focus on something. And secondly, if you're going to do this, if we're going to overcome apathy, you're going to have to embrace what hurts. You're going to have to embrace what hurts, which is the very opposite of comfort, by the way. Many of us, when there's an issue that hurts us in the world, we start to avoid it. And we say things like, don't even tell me about that, please. I, I get too affected by that. If, if, your issue, if orphans touch your heart, then suddenly you don't want to hear about the kids, you don't want to hear about the orphans, if there's widows that they're going through, if there's racial injustice, you get so impassioned, you're like, I just rather don't want to hear those stories, and we start to avoid what hurts. But if we're going to overcome apathy, we have to embrace what hurts. You can hear that's what Paul did in Romans 9. He said, my heart is filled with this anguish of the suffering, and he's not trying to avoid that. He's embracing that. If we're going to overcome apathy, we have to embrace the very things that hurt us and disturb us because that's where God wants to use us. You know, my wife and I had to really make this decision last year. We had the opportunity to foster for a few months a little baby. And uh, we called a family meeting, which is very interesting when you have like two-year-olds that you're meeting. But... We just talked to our kids, and we said, you know what, there's this little baby who needs a home for a few months, and she's not going to live here forever. At that time, that wasn't the plan, because her family could take her back. And we said, she's probably not going to live here forever, and she's going to go back to her family one day, but if she lives with us, we're going to love her, and we're going to get attached to her, we're going to have fun with her and know her. But I want you to know from day one, if she comes, at some point we also have to say goodbye. We're going to have to let her go, and we're not going to have control of where she goes. We didn't know the home she's going to go to. But are you okay with this? And that was a big decision for our family to make. Almost all the kids were already in tears, and Jada hadn't even come into our house yet, and they were already just sad by the idea of saying goodbye to this baby they hadn't even met yet. And you know, as a family, we decided we would rather give Jada that experience than save ourselves from a heartbreak. 
We would rather let her come and experience God's love and experience Christianity and experience a family dynamic and experience what it's like to have a mom and a dad and and a healthy family environment with fun and laughter. We would rather give her that than avoid it just to save ourselves some heartbreak. And so we knew we were signing up to have our hearts broken, but it was worth it. It's worth it. I'd rather have my heart broken and do something with my life. And I think that's what apathy, apathy is going to fight against. But the reality is, even though it's easier not to care, I would rather hurt with a purpose than exist without one. I'd rather hurt with a purpose than exist without one. I'd, I'd rather end up crying myself to sleep at night because I don't see the issues resolved than just going through life, binge watching Netflix, being addicted to my phone, playing subway surfers. I would rather hurt and exist with a purpose than exist without one. Church, my prayer for you is that God would bless you with a godly burden. I pray he would bless you with a godly burden that that apathy would not be what characterizes New Life Church in Woodbank. That apathy would not be what characterizes the body of Christ over here. I pray that you would be blessed with a godly burden the same way that Moses was blessed with a righteous discomfort about the way his people were being treated until it moved him to action and he worked in front of Pharaoh and said, let my people go. I pray that you would be given the same kind of godly discomfort the way David experienced when he stood in front of the army and he saw another man. He happened to be a giant, but he was still a man teasing his God. And he said, that is not okay. And he had righteous discomfort that moved him to action. I pray that you would have the same kind of righteous discomfort that moved Nehemiah, even though he was comfortable serving the king in the palace and his people were thousands of kilometers away. He said, it's not okay that my city still lies in ruins. And he left his place of comfort and went and organized and recruited and built the walls. I pray you have the same kind of righteous discomfort that God had when he looked at us that Jesus had when he looked at Jerusalem and wept and said, my sheep have no shepherd. And so why the good shepherd? I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. I'm going to walk away from every comfort. I'm going to leave the throne of heaven and come and die. Because that's what true love looks like. I pray that you would be blessed with a godly burden today. I know that comfort, comfort, it's nice, it's a drug, but we need to break free from apathy, making our life and faith about convenience and about us, and we have to remember, church, that the needs of this world, the issues of this world, they're up to us to solve. They're up to us to solve. They're not up to the United Nations or some government. They're ours. They're ours. They're ours to solve. So I want to ask you today, will you put yourself in a place where you are consistently exposed to something that will create a righteous discomfort in your heart? Will you do that? Will you make a commitment to consistently expose yourself to the same things that break the heart of God? It's what God desires for His church. That's what living like an overcomer looks like. It's not about us. It's about us being ambassadors and bringing the kingdom of heaven down to earth. So focus on something. (laughs) What's breaking your heart? What what causes close to your heart? Focus on that. And then you walk towards the hurt. You walk towards the heartbreak. You walk towards the inconvenient. You walk towards the sacrifice and you say, this is worth it. This is worth it. I know that as we do that, We're going to overcome apathy. We're going to break free from the drug of comfort. And we're going to make a real impact in this world for God. And so God, today, that's our prayer. That's our prayer, Lord. God, we don't want to reduce you. We don't want to reduce you to a being that serves us. We want to acknowledge, God, we live to serve you. 
I thank you, God, that you have commissioned us, your children, to deliver hope to this world, to deliver your hope, to deliver your life, to deliver your life to this world. So God, we want to listen. We want to move. God, we don't, we don't want our faith to just live in our heads. We want it to move to our hearts, to our hands, to our feet, to make a difference. So point us, God. Point our lives in the right direction. Point our lives to, towards the cause that you are calling us for. Father, I want to just come against apathy in the name of Jesus Christ. I come against a lack of concern in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak against indifference in the name of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you would give us a godly burden. Uh, may our hearts break for whatever breaks your hearts. May we see people the way you see them. May our heart beat for the same things that your heart beats for. I thank you, God, that this morning, I thank you that your love for us moved us to action. May we go and do the same in this world, I pray. With every eye closed, I want us to stay in this attitude of prayer right now.